that they left with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Uqba ibn Amir is narrating his 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 hadith that I left with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the Ghazwa of Tabuk, and one day, one morning, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam began narrating uh, to us, and of the things that he said is this hadith. This is a famous hadith that uh, whoever uh, stands up to pray after the sun has risen and he does wudu and he perfects his wudu and he prays two rak'at all of his sins will be forgiven uh, and he will be like the day his mother gave birth to him now pause here this is about the one who prays fajr and he stays and he does dhikr and he uh, praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then he prays salat al-duha salat al-duha he prays it so this person the Prophet said all of his sins will be forgiven if you perfect salat al-duha after you prayed Fajr, and then you basically uh, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your sins will be forgiven. And Uqba said, I said after this, Alhamdulillah who has allowed me to hear this from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar ibn al-Khattab was sitting next to me, and he said, Are you amazed at this hadith? For verily I heard a hadith that is more pleasing to me than that one. I heard something even better than this. So Uqba said, Tell me. What is this hadith? So Umar said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam say, whoever does wudu and he perfects his wudu and he raises his head to the skies and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh All of the eight gates of Jannah are open for him and he can enter from whichever one he pleases. So isn't it easier to do wudu and say the dhikr than to pray two rak'ahs after fajr, right? So Umar is saying, I have a better hadith than this. And so that's the point that they are basically, and both of these hadith are uh, beautiful. Both of these hadith are ones that we can um, benefit from. Uh, and uh, of the hadith as well of Jabir ibn Abdullah that he said, Umar ibn Khattab said to me that I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say, a time will come when a group of people will pass by the peripheries of Medina and they will say inside here there used to live a lot of believers once upon a time what is this hadith indicating there will be a lack of inhabitants of Medina this is predicted in many a hadith Bukhari and Muslim that one of the signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah is Medina will be uninhabited. And when will that take place? After the Dajjal. After the Dajjal. Because when the Dajjal comes, Medina will be safe. Right? So after the Dajjal, there will come a time when Mecca and Medina both will be uninhabited. They will be in ruins. Completely in ruins. And this is the reference here. That... Umar ibn Khattab is saying, I heard the Prophet say, a time will come when caravans will go by and they'll pass by Medina and they'll say, there used to be Muslims who live there. Right? So Medina will remain inhabited from the time of the Prophet until the very end of times. And that will be then the uh, uh, right before the Qiyamah. And that's something that is mentioned in uh, Bukhari and Muslim and other hadith as well. Uh, and the next hadith will do that Umar al-Khattab said that one day the Prophet was distributing uh, the wealth to the people and Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, there are people who deserve this more than these people you're giving. The people of the Sufa, Ahl al-Sufa. Ahl al-Sufa, why don't you give it to them? So the Prophet sallallahu said, you are putting me between two situations. Either these people that are in front of me will be forced to ask with greater uh, begging or that they will accuse me of being stingy. And I am not a stingy person. Meaning, O oh Umar, I know best what to do and I need to give to these people as well. Because if I don't give to them, these are the Bedouins, these are the people. So Umar al-Khattab is saying, why are you giving to these Bedouins? Give to the people of the Sufa. They are more deserving. And the Prophet is saying, if I don't give to them, then they will resort to being even more persistent in how they ask. And then they're going to accuse me of being stingy. And I'm not a stingy person. So I'm going to give to them. And that's the, uh, the point here is that the Prophet knows best basically uh, who to give it to. 
Uh, the next hadith that we're going to do is uh, Umar ibn Khattab said, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, the Ansar said, we're going to have two leaders, one from us and one from you. So I said to them, O oh, people of the Ansar, don't you know that the Prophet ﷺ appointed Abu Bakr to lead the prayer? So who amongst you is going to be happy that you lead Abu Bakr in prayer. Look at how he refuted them. Right? You all know that Abu Bakr is our Imam in Salah. If one of you were to be the Amir, who amongst you would like that Abu Bakr is behind him? So they said, we seek Allah's refuge from ever standing in front of Abu Bakr. And that was the end of that. And we know what happened when this the uh, Saqifah Banu Sa'ada took place, that Umar al Khattab basically said to them, you can't have two leaders. You have to have one, and it has to be Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And that is exactly what um, happened. Uh, of the um, a hadith as well, uh, of the hadith as well that we're going to do is the next one, <clears throat> that Umar al Khattab said, I agreed with my Lord in three things. I agreed with my Lord in three things. Number one, I said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, why don't you pray behind the Maqam Ibrahim? And Allah revealed in the Quran, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِنْ مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ Musalla. Pray behind the Maqam Ibrahim. Number two, I said, Ya Rasulullah, your wives, people that are good and people that are bad, they both enter upon them. So why don't you command them with hijab? And so Allah revealed Ayatul Hijab. And number three, that once the uh, wives of the Prophet ﷺ came complaining about something, and, uh, and this was the famous incident we did in the seerah, uh, that the whole month long issue that took place, and I said, and this is exactly what he said to his daughter Hafsa, exactly what he said, that Asa Rabbuhu in Talaqa Kunna Yabdullahu Azwaj and Khairam in Kun. That if you are divorced, uh, that his Lord will choose for him wives better than you. He said this to his own daughter, because his daughter was one of the wives, right? And what he said, literally, in essence, it was revealed later on. Okay? So he's saying, I agreed with Allah in three matters. I agreed with Allah in three matters. Now, of course, he is being, of course, polite here. What he's trying to say is, I said three things, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then confirmed the truth of what I said. That is what the, the meaning of this uh, hadith is. Uh, the next hadith is the famous hadith that is uh, a very beautiful one for all of us that I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say continue frequenting between Hajj and Umrah because continually repeating the Hajj and Umrah expels poverty and sins from you just like a furnace expels impurities and dirt. dirt. In other words, don't be happy with one Hajj and one Umrah. Keep on going for Hajj and Umrah. Keep on going for Hajj and Umrah, and that will expel from you poverty and uh, dirt. Uh, the next hadith is, of course, the most famous hadith of Umar ibn Khattab. This is the most famous hadith of Umar ibn Khattab. It is the first hadith of Bukhari. And it is, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَلِكُلِّ مْرِئِ مَّا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانِتْ هِجْرَةُ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ فَهِجْرَةُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ وَمَنْ كَانِتْ هِجْرَةُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ مْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَةُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ This is the most famous hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ It's the first hadith of Bukhari, and it is the hadith only narrated by Umar. Nobody else narrated this hadith. This is the famous hadith of Infiradat uh, Umar, i.e. only Umar narrated this hadith, and it translates as, all actions will be judged by intentions and every person will only achieve what he or she intended and uh, i comment on this all the time that i say the only system in which you are rewarded for what you desired and not what you achieved is the system of islam only allah azza wa jal will look at your inner heart everybody else will look at what you've done your boss doesn't care about your niya your teacher and professor doesn't care how much efforts you put in. He cares about what you did in the exam. Right? Only Allah, because Allah knows the heart, doesn't care about what you achieve. He cares about what's in here. And that's the hadith of Umar al-Khattab. That actions are only judged by intentions. The whole judging is based on what you wanted. And 
the actual result and the actual success is really irrelevant. What matters to Allah is what's inside, not what's outside. And this hadith of Umar is of course the first hadith in our Sahih Bukhari and it's a hadith all of us are aware of. So the same deed could be done and you can have the highest of rewards or you can have a punishment or zero rewards. So your hijrah can be for Allah and His Messenger and your hijrah can be for business or marriage. Whoever is was for Allah and His Messenger will get Jannah and whoever was, was for business and marriage, he will get whatever he wanted. Right, so, and of course this was in reference to um, a person from Mecca who emigrated to Medina uh, only to marry a lady from Medina. And they became, some of the, the muhajirun said, will he get the rewards that we're getting? That's not fair. He didn't come with our sacrifice. He didn't have to give up. He wasn't persecuted. Will he get what, what we're getting? And so the Prophet uh, said this famous um, hadith. Uh, the uh, next hadith that we're going to do is the uh, hadith of uh, Umar al-Khattab that the Prophet said, Al-Waladu lil-Firash, the famous hadith, two words, Al-Waladu lil-Firash. This is the max maxim of fiqh, it has become a maxim of legal ruling. Al-Waladu lil-Firash. The child shall as be ascribed to the bed it was born in. Meaning, we do not bring in any doubt. Any child that is born to an official marriage, the child is that marriage's child. The son and the, the, will be the, of the father and whatnot. And of course in Jahiliya, they had other systems. In Jahiliya, there were techniques that if a father denied the paternity of his child, he could do this, he could do that, right? And in Islam, no. We don't care about anything other than the firash, the, the nikah. If the nikah is valid, we get rid of doubt. And this is the purpose of the hadith, al-waladu lil-firash. We don't open this door. Uh, and we assume the best. And as you know, the famous hadith, not related to the Sulaim, but uh, a man came to the process, of, or not in this wording, a man came to the process and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, my uh, son was born and he has a different skin color than me. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, that, do you have camels? He said, yes. So he said, what color are they? So he said, red. So he said, is there any that is darker than that? He said, yes, I have one that is dark. So he said, where did that darkness come from? So the man said, maybe it was a blood vein of one of them. That's what they thought. Maybe there was a blood vein of one of the mothers that would be made this one dark. So he says, so this too, it was the blood vein of one of the mothers. Okay. Meaning, don't think too much. Don't accuse your wife without any evidence. Okay. That's another issue of modern fiqh, and that's a separate issue. What are modern fuqaha going to do with that? And that's a valid question. That's a valid question. But the point is that we expel doubt as much as possible, and we al walad hulil farash, as our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said. Uh, the next hadith, which is very beneficial for all of us, which always comes up the same thing, that a man came to Umar ibn Khattab, and I said, and he said, Allah says in the Quran that there is no sin on you to shorten your prayers when you are traveling if you are scared of being attacked. And he said, we don't have any fear right now of being attacked. So why do we shorten the prayers? So Ibn al-Khattab responded, I too was questioning this ayah exactly like you questioned it. And I asked the Prophet ﷺ exactly like you questioned me. And the Prophet ﷺ responded, Sadaqatun tasaddaq Allahu biha alaykum faqbalu sadaqatahu. This is a charity that Allah has given to you. So accept his charity. Meaning you don't have to be in a situation of fear. It's a charity. Allah has allowed you whenever you're traveling to make qasr. So accept his charity. So this is the hadith. And this shows you why you cannot just interpret the Quran without hadith. Because if you were to interpret the Qur'an without hadith, then, well, you would start a lot of problems, but of them is you would not do qasr. Because qasr is only allowed in the Qur'an with a clear two conditions. Number one, traveling. Number two, fear of attack. If you're fearful of attack, then shorten. And that condition has in essence been abrogated by this hadith. And the Prophet said it doesn't matter if you're scared, fearful or not, you are allowed to shorten the uh, salah. Uh, the next